Good evening. Uh, we'll just uh, make a start. We're not going to uh, have any singing tonight. Uh, we'll go straight into uh, the Word of God. And then if you sit up nicely, then there may be pizza and chips afterwards for you to enjoy. But I'm looking for your very best attention. Uh, let's, uh, let's pray. Our God and Father, we recognize that uh, we need the Holy Spirit in order to understand the Word of God for the natural mind and the natural man cannot comprehend these things. And we just want to give thanks this evening that you've sent the Holy Spirit to be our comforter, uh, to be our teacher, to be an encourager. We often think we would uh, love to have just been there in the presence of Jesus as he uh, spoke in Galilee and as he was in Jerusalem and places like Bethany. And just to spend a day with him would have been absolutely wonderful. But uh, we give thanks that you've not left us as orphans that uh, although the Lord Jesus has ascended on high, you have sent the Holy Spirit uh, to be with us and to be in us. And uh, we give thanks for his ministry, and we pray that uh, you'll open our minds and hearts as, uh, through the Holy Spirit that uh, what the eye cannot see, nor the ear hear, nor things that can enter into the heart of man. We give thanks that you have revealed those things to us by your Spirit the Spirit who searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. And uh, we pray that this may have a practical impact tonight, not just a theoretical study, but it may uh, affect our lives, our ministry, our uh, behavior in all aspects. And we look to you for help in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. Now, when we think about the Holy Spirit, um, you know, automatically, I think sometimes our, our brains go to Acts chapter 2 and we think of the, the coming of the Spirit, which is a remarkable event, and uh, God willing, we'll look at that in future weeks. But, um, you know, the ministry of the Holy Spirit really goes right back to Genesis chapter 1, verse 2, the second verse in the Bible. Um, first of all, we've got, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And the earth was formless and void and darkness was over the face of the deep. The world was in existence at that point. It was formless, it was void, it was dark. But the Spirit of God was moving over the surface of the waters. Um, and I want you to just remember that phrase, uh, was moving over, because we'll come across this later on in our study this evening. But the Spirit of God uh, had an impact and influence um, in the Hebrew. Uh, it's the word ruach. Um, and uh, just to prove it there, we've got the interlinear Bible, and uh, that's the word that's used. It's uh, sometimes uh, the word uh, is expressed as spirit or wind or breath. Um, Psalm 33 says, By the word of the Lord the heavens were made their starry host by the breath of his mouth. Now, uh, Carol Sagan, who is uh, certainly not a believer, he's a, an atheist in fact, but he's a, a bit of an um, as, astronomer, um, in his book says the cosmos uh, is the Greek word for the order of the universe. It is in a way the opposite of chaos. Quite remarkable at page four in his book, you know, he's saying this, that he recognizes there's an order to the universe and he finds it remarkable it's not chaos. Um, you know, we just need a couple of traffic cones uh, to be in the road and the motorway and we've got all sorts of chaos. You know, we think of the, the scale of the universe, you know, it's absolutely remarkable, isn't it? It's all held in balance. Um, looking at this picture, which is just really a tiny uh, parcel of the universe, um, you see those bright lights. Now, uh, when I looked at this first, I thought that these bright lights represented stars. They don't. They represent galaxies. And each of these galaxies has roughly 100 billion stars in them. And uh, most of the, 
the uh, stars of planets like uh, we have around the sun. And, uh, you know, it's quite remarkable, isn't it? I, I was speaking at uh, Lennox a few weeks ago uh, on Elohim, uh, which was invited to do, and just remarking that, um, you know, I, I'd been sitting on Cullen Beach and lifted up a handful of sand and let the, the grains of sand fall through my fingers. And I'd heard that uh, someone say that there were more stars in the universe than there were grains of sand on the earth. And I thought, somebody's made a huge mistake here. Because I looked around about you know, one and a half miles of Cullen Beach and thought of all the grains of sand. And then I thought of the Sahara Desert <laughs> and all over the world and beaches and whatnot. And uh, uh, some... And mathematicians counted up there's 7.56 trillion grains of sand in the world but in fact there are 36 trillion there's about uh, 20 times <laughs> greater the number of stars in the universe and this is all the work of the holy spirit um the, the world was without form and void and we we know it today as a beautiful planet isn't it Amazing, even in our age, we can see uh, such a, a beautiful spectrum. Uh, we, uh, there's a BBC program that's on this afternoon, in fact, called The Perfect Planet. And uh, we see a lot of beauty in uh, our planet, but just think what it was like before the fall of man. Uh, we don't have a perfect planet today by any means, um, but uh, the Lord God, the Holy Spirit, uh, made those things. Uh, we look at biology and classification of animals and just the sheer variety and the color and the diversity. Um, you know, these are all under the uh, control of the Holy Spirit. We often think of just the Holy Spirit in terms of theological things, but isn't it amazing to think that uh, it says in Psalm 104, uh, concerning the animal kingdom, these all wait for you, that you give them their food in due season. What you give them, they gather in. You open your hand, they are filled with good. You hide your face, they are troubled. You take away their breath, they die and return to their dust. You send forth your spirit, they are created, and you renew the face of the earth. Just think when we're looking at spring <laughs> and the daffodils and the snowdrops and the crocuses and the life and the buds begin to come in the tree. That is all a work, I believe, of the, of the Holy Spirit of God. Um, you know, Isaiah chapter 32 talks about a time when um, the, the world will be changed. It, it says it will be this way until the Spirit is poured out upon us from heaven and the desert becomes a field giving so much fruit that it seems as if it has many trees. And uh, you know, the world is going to be changed one day when the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords reigns. So not only did uh, the Holy, was the Holy Spirit active in terms of the galaxies and the stars and the formation of the world and the animal kingdom, but it tells us in Genesis chapter 2, then the Lord God formed man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living being the very breath of god uh, i want to now read just a, a bit from ezekiel chapter 37 the valley of dry bones i'm sure you're all familiar with your hip bone being joined to your knee bone and all that sort of stuff but uh uh, just bear with me as we read through this. I think it's a quite amazing chapter. The hand of the Lord was on me and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. He led me back and forth among them and I saw a great many bones on the floor of the valley, bones that were very dry. He asked me, son of man, can these bones live? And here, Ezekiel gives a very sensible answer. <laughs> he says, I said, Sovereign Lord, you alone know. Then he said to me, prophesy to these bones and say to them, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the Sovereign Lord says to the bones. I will make breath enter you and you will come to life. 
I will attach tendons to you and make flesh come upon you and cover you with skin. I will put breath in you and you will come to life. Then you will know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded and as I was prophesying, there was a noise, a rattling sound and the bones came together, bone to bone. I looked and tendons and flesh appeared on them and skin covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy son of man and say to it, this is what the sovereign Lord says, come breath from the four winds and breathe into these slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded and breath entered them. They came to life and stood up on their feet, a vast army. Then he said to me, son of man, these bones are the people of Israel. They say, our bones are dried up and our hope is gone. We are cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says. My people, I am going to open your graves and bring you up from them. I will bring you back to the land of Israel. Then you, my people, will know that I am the Lord. When I open your graves and uh, bring you up from them, I will put my spirit in you and you will live and I will settle you in your own land. Then you will know that I, the Lord, have spoken and I have done it, declares the Lord. And so we have Ezekiel with this, uh, what I think is a vision that's, uh, uh, you know, that's a sort of parable given in a vision to Ezekiel and it's a, a scene of dry dead bones but the power of the word of God and the power of the spirit of God is such that it will bring to life that the nation of Israel is is get no hope it's dead but God through his spirit and through his word is going to bring it to life again and we have a similar sort of state in the gospel message, don't we? Uh, Leonard Ravenhill says, Jesus did not come into the world to make bad men good. He came into the world to make dead men live. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 1, And you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and in sins. Just as Israel was dead, just a valley of dry bones, we are dead in our trespasses and in our sins, but through the quickening uh, word of the Holy Spirit, the breath of God, we are made alive in Christ Jesus. Martin Luther said, God made man out of nothing, and as long as we are nothing, he can make something out of us. And we have to realize that, you know, we can't contribute one iota towards our own salvation. We are dead. We can't lift a little finger. But the, the breath of God and the word of God is what is necessary. Sometimes in order to just realize the value of something, you have to think about how you would live without, you know, a particular uh, person or a particular uh, item etc and uh, I just want to quickly go through you know some of the things that we can't do without the Holy Spirit uh, first of all you can't be saved without the Holy Spirit uh, John chapter 3 in the conversation with Nicodemus unless one is born of water and of the Spirit he cannot enter the kingdom of God we have to be born of the Spirit we cannot have assurance of our salvation without the Holy Spirit. Uh, Romans chapter 8, verse 16. I hope you know this very well, folks in Bethesda. Just having been going through Romans chapter 8. I think it was uh, Ken that was doing this one. Um, and uh, if you have forgotten it, then it's Ken's fault. But, uh, you know, the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God, that we have this uh, testimony uh, from God, uh, the Spirit himself bears witness. You can't be fruitful without the Holy Spirit. And uh, we'll look at this in a, a study in future months, God willing. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. 
You can't understand the Bible <laughs> without the Holy Spirit. Um, it takes, you know, the Spirit of God to open our eyes. Oh, yes, you can read the Bible, you can read the words, but the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. And that is why we should always pray as we, um, you know, we turn to the Scriptures in order that the Holy Spirit will make the book live to us. <laughs> Make the book live to me, O Lord. Show me thyself within thy word. Show me, my, show me yourself and show me your, my Savior. Make the book live to me, O Lord. So we can't understand the Bible without the Holy Spirit. You can't pray without the Holy Spirit. Again, Romans chapter 8, verse 26. And if you've forgotten this one, it's my fault. It says, likewise, the Spirit also helps us in our weakness, uh, for we do not know what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which uh, cannot be uttered. And so as we pray, uh, we pray in the Spirit. And we need um, you know, to realize it's more than just our words. It's the, the unction of the Holy Spirit that helps us. And we cannot worship without the Holy Spirit. John chapter 4. In the conversation with the woman at the well, uh, the woman says, you know, should we worship in Jerusalem, as Jew you Jews say, or should we worship in the mountains, as been the tradition of the Samaritans? And Jesus says, an hour is coming, and now is when the true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For such people, the Father seeks to be his worshippers. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and truth you cannot witness without the holy spirit <laughs> you cannot witness effectively that is remember you know in acts chapter one um the disciples and the early church are told to stay in jerusalem and not move uh, he commanded them not to depart from jerusalem but to wait for the promise of the father which he said, you have heard from me, for John baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. And just a few days pass, and uh, then God says through the Spirit in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses. You can't serve God without the Holy Spirit. At least you can't serve him effectively and in his will. First uh, Corinthians chapter 12, which we looked at a few months ago, there are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but the same God who works uh, all of them in all men. Now to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. The Holy Spirit is uh, just as he moved upon that dark and void uh, world <laughs> back in Genesis, you know, moves upon his church and he, he is creative and he gives different kinds of working. There's diversity. We're not all made the same, but he has uh, given uh, the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. What does it say in Zechariah chapter 4? Thus he said to me, this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel saying, not by strength, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of all. Um, John chapter 1 just emphasizes the point that, you know, we are absolutely dependent upon the Holy Spirit. We, we can't, by our own apologetics and our own persuasion, and you know, our own pressure make people believers. It's a work of the Holy Spirit. But as many as received him to them, gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, not of the will of the flesh, not of the will of man, but born of God. And we'll see just in a moment how that, uh, you know, this was... Uh, 
It was a virgin birth that uh, brought forth the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's uh, not got man's input to the virgin birth, and we don't have man's input to the, the, the birth of a new believer. Um, although God uses uh, man <laughs> as instruments in various ways, it's only uh, regeneration by the Spirit. Don't be ignorant about the Holy Spirit. Uh, that was um, you know, a warning to uh, the believers in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Uh, do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? We, we ought to remember that. And uh, I think if we do remember uh, you know, the fact that uh, our bodies are temple, the temple of the Holy Spirit, it will affect you know, just how we behave <laughs> Um, you know, we won't be uh, watching this or that. <laughs> um, if we're conscious that the Holy Spirit is <laughs> there in us and with us in the situation, we won't be gossiping um, and, you know, spreading stories because the Holy Spirit is the witness to every conversation and it will change our behavior. And there is a danger in being ignorant about the work and the manifestation of the Holy Spirit. Um, not only do we have um, the, uh, the work of the Holy Spirit in terms of a church sense and a theological sense, but, you know, it affects every part of our life. Uh, it says in Ephesians chapter 5, do not uh, get drunk and wine for that dis is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. And he goes on in Ephesians chapter 5 to talk about our marriage relationship, sorry, uh, ladies, this was the first one that came up. I didn't have time for getting into all the different verses that follow here. But, you know, just as wives should be subject to their own husbands, as to the Lord, husbands should love their wives, even as Christ loves the church and gave, some, gave himself for it. And children uh, should obey your parents in, that, in Ephesians chapter 6. And it tells us how to behave in the workplace that the spirit-filled person is not a saint at home and a devil abroad. Uh, the spirit-filled person um, should have a consistent life. I remember the funeral of a, of a friend down in Ayrshire, and uh, his son said to um, the people gathered there, my father was exactly the same man in the house as he was on the platform. There was a consistency. And... Uh, that is what it means to be filled with the Spirit. It's not, um, it, it, you know, if we're filled with the Spirit of, of God, it should affect every single part of our uh, day and our attention. Now, I said earlier uh, that we should bear in mind that phrase, and the Spirit of God was moving over the surface of the waters. Uh, we have in Deuteronomy chapter 32, <coughs> Uh, the same uh, Hebrew word. I'm not a, a Hebrew scholar and whatnot, but um, you can look up so easily on the internet and get the same words, etc. These days, um, he it, he shielded him and cared for him. He guarded him as the apple of his eye. This is talking about Israel, like an eagle that stirs up its nest and hovers over its young that spreads its wings to catch them and carries them aloft. So just as, you know, uh, an eagle, uh, you know, pays attention to its nest, it hovers over them. So the, the Spirit of God was hovering over, he was moving over the, the surface of the earth and made something that was dark and void and um, without form into something beautiful. So it is that, um, God uh, is pictured here as an eagle uh, hovering over its young. Um, and we have um, a similar expression. Obviously, the Bible, the Old Testament is mainly written in Hebrew, and the New Testament is uh, largely written in Greek, so you don't have exactly the same words, but um, there's a sort of Greek equivalent. Um, in Luke chapter 1, verse 35, the angel answered and said to Mary, the Holy Spirit will come on you and the power of the Most High will overshadow. We will hover over you. 
Uh, so the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. So just as it's, uh, as I said earlier, you know, there's no input for man to our salvation. As uh, Lewis was emphasizing this morning, you know, it's not on what man can do, do, it's in what God has D-O-N-E done. That is the work. It's all been done by Jesus Christ upon the cross. And he died and he rose again, and we stake our whole eternity on him. It's not our death, it's not our uh, pain, it's on his work. And so, um, you know, into that womb of Mary, the Holy Spirit um, overshadowed and uh, Jesus uh, was born. And we have the same word um, in uh, 2 Peter uh, in relation to the Bible, the Word of God. Um, he says there, knowing the, this verse, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. For prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. And so God used men as the instrument. It was uh, not their uh, thoughts or their ideas, but the Holy Spirit um, moved and, uh, it, you know, gave them the words and uh, inspired them to, to write. And we'll come to that a bit more in just in a moment. How is the word of God described? In Ephesians chapter 6, we've got the armor of God and uh, we have the Bible described as the sword of the Spirit. Uh, take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. With all prayer and petition, pray at all times in the Spirit. And with this in view, be on alert with all perseverance and petition for all the saints. So we have the sword of the Spirit. It's a, a sharp, two-edged sword. It's, you know, when we have the Word of God, it, it, it penetrates. And it's important that we stick to the Word of God in our preaching. And I would tend to encourage you to take most of our illustrations from the Bible. There are plenty of illustrations throughout the Old Testament and the parables and so on. And, uh, you know, it's the Word of God. We don't need to get all clever with uh, science and all these kind of things when we're, um, you know, contemporary things. But, uh, you know, when, when uh, Paul was writing... Um, he, he arrived at Thessalonica with such impact and he was, he was recalling to them the good news, the gospel did not come to you uh, by word only, but with power and with the Holy Spirit and with a deep conviction. How many times do we hear, you know, uninspired sermons? You know, it's very, very possible to preach an old dry bones type of word of God, but you can tell when the Holy Spirit is, uh, is anointing the word of God, we're so dependent upon him that that is where the power is. When the Holy Spirit, and we, as I said earlier, when we turn to the word of God, we ought to pray into it and not just turn up, you know, for example, to a meeting like this, you know, to preach or to hear the Word of God. But we ought to pray that the Holy Spirit will, uh, will help us. And uh, when the gospel, uh, you know, the Word of God is, is, is read, you know, it can be read in many a pulpit, many a church, without any impact. And people leave and just go out, and it's just been a nice wee word. <laughs> but if we want power, we need uh, the manifestation and the work of the Holy Spirit. The scriptures are adequate. All scripture is God-breathed. It's the same expression. And is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. It's, uh, we're into the Greek now rather than the Hebrew 
but God breathed. Theo for God. Uh, Puritus uh, for breathe. Uh, you get words like pneumonia and things like that. Pneumo uh, for, your, for your lungs and your breath, etc. It's God breathed into the scriptures, just as he breathed into man uh, and made him a living soul. Uh, God has breathed into the scriptures. When uh, Paul, uh, sorry, Peter was uh, uh, preaching, he says, and we are witnesses of these things, and so also is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to them that obey him. The Lord Jesus rose from the dead, and he was declared the Son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead, according to the spirit of holiness, Jesus Christ, our Lord. He's opened up our eyes to the fact that he is raised from the dead. Hallelujah. Surprising just the disbelief these days in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I was listening to a man up in Mulgai go through what a... There's no point in Christianity. <laughs> if Jesus Christ has not been raised from the dead. And it seems, you know, to the natural man so crazy. Richard Dawkins, as we heard in the film uh, last week, was saying it's so petty, it's so insignificant, so unimportant. Uh, Christopher Hitchens in the film was saying, you know, that uh, he didn't need his five minutes to talk about the resurrection. He could just dismiss it right away. But, you know, we as believers have been inspired by the Holy Spirit to know that, uh, you know, the Son of God is raised. He is a, the Son of God by power, by the resurrection from the dead. This word, dynami, <laughs> again, I've put up the sort of interlinear there, just in case you don't believe me, but, uh, you know, we've got this, you get uh, dynamic um, and so on, uh, dynamite, <laughs> the power um, and, uh, you know, it is very possible to just have a form of godliness, but deny the power thereof from such turn away. Percival Lowell um, was an American astronomer, and um, they didn't have the same uh, telescopes as we have today in order to look at the planets in the universe. Um, and back in 1905, uh, he couldn't see Pluto. Um, I don't mean the Disney character there, but there's uh, uh, what used to be called a planet. It's no longer designated a planet, but there's Pluto. And, uh, you know, he couldn't see it. And nobody in the world up to that point had known that there was uh, such a planet or whatever as Pluto, um, but he could tell that, um, you know, by looking at uh, Uranus and Neptune, that uh, they were affected by a gravitational force in some way, and he suggested that the only explanation for their orbits and their uh, reactions to the gravitational force was uh, that there must be you know, a, a, another planet out there. And uh, then uh, back in uh, um, 1930, uh, another astronomer, uh, Clyde Tombo from the Lowell Observatory, um, you know, had another look at this. And based on the predictions of Lowell and the other astronomers, and with a big telescope, he established there was Pluto. It hadn't been visible, but it was there all the time. And, uh, you know, that's maybe a very pure illustration of, you know, the Holy Spirit is invisible <laughs> in our lives, and sometimes we're not conscious of his, his uh, work in us and work through us and whatnot, but the Holy Spirit is shaping you. There's a gravitational pull, as it were, on your life that uh, is influencing what you do um, even although it might not be visible uh, to you in that sense. 
And now, uh, just a, a short word. Um, I've ordered the pizzas for 20 past seven, so we're not going to be too much longer. If somebody could maybe collect them, by the way, will you do that, Ken? Um, so, I uh, just want to talk about the personality of the Holy Spirit. Um, in order to have a personality, um, you know, what makes us different from robots, for example, is that we have a will, we have emotions, we have an intellect, uh, our thinking, our reasoning, uh, our emotions, we feel sad, glad, mad, etc. And, uh, you know, the, the Holy Spirit has a personality. He helps us. He has a mind, the mind of the Spirit. The Holy Spirit prays for us. He intercedes for us. He's active. Romans chapter 15. I beseech you, brethren, for the Lord Jesus Christ's sake and for the love of the Spirit that you strive together with me in your prayers to God for me. So the, the Holy Spirit is someone who loves <laughs> He's got a mind. He's got a direction. It's also, um, you know, he also has a capacity to be grieved. Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you're sealed unto the day of redemption. We have uh, that same expression back in Isaiah chapter 63, um, talking about the nation of Israel and their misbehavior. At times, he says, in all their distress, he too was distressed. And the angel of his presence saved them. In his love and mercy, he redeemed them. He lifted them up and carried them all the days of old. Yet they rebelled and grieved the Holy Spirit. How sad it is to grieve the Holy Spirit. Uh, Nehemiah, um, you know, talks about you gave your good spirit to instruct them. So he's uh, got a personality. He's a comforter. Uh, John chapter 15, when the Comforter is come, uh, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth which proceedeth from the Father, he shall testify of me. So he's active. <laughs> he has the capacity to forbid. When uh, Paul um, was one to go to uh, a certain area, um, they were forbidden by the Holy Ghost, and the Spirit suffered them not. So the Holy Spirit speaks, uh, Revelation chapter 2, He that had an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Um, both in the Old Testament and the New Testament, there's a, a, a joined upness, um, Acts chapter 28, uh, Paul says, uh, this is just the last chapter, the Holy Spirit spoke the truth to your early fathers through the early preacher Isaiah. He said, go to these people and say, you will hear and never understand, you will look and never see. So he's quoting from Isaiah, it's the Holy Spirit that spoke the truth to your early fathers. And there from Isaiah chapter 6, that well-known chapter, you have that, uh, that verse. So it's the Holy Spirit that uh, is speaking there in Isaiah chapter 6. Um, Second Samuel, uh, again, the Holy Spirit speaks and communicates. These are the last words of David. The Spirit of the Lord spoke by me. His word was on my tongue. The God of Israel has spoken. The rock of Israel said to me, the Spirit of the Lord speaks. And uh, you've got various examples. Ezekiel the Spirit of God came upon me and he said, tell them this is what the Lord says. This is what you thought, O people of Israel, for I know the things that have come into your mind. Uh, David is attributed in Mark chapter 12 by Jesus, for David himself, led by the Holy Spirit, said, the Lord said to my Lord, etc. Now, I just want to spend uh, a few minutes um, talking about the deity of the Holy Spirit. Um, like the Jehovah's Witnesses um, say the Holy Spirit is an invisible active force of Almighty God which moves his servants to do his will. As for the Holy Spirit, the so-called third person of the Trinity, we've already seen that it is not a person 
but God's active force. So, you know, as I said earlier, uh, he is a person because he's got personality and he can be grieved and uh, love, etc. Mormonism says uh, Jesus Christ, a little babe like all the rest of us, have been grew to be a man, was filled with a divine substance or fluid called the Holy Spirit. Again, error. <laughs> but as believers, uh, we believe that there is a, a trinity and the Holy Spirit is equal. He is part of the Godhead. Um, you know, we have such verses as Matthew 28 that could go on all night with many, many more. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, uh, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. We could, as I say, hundreds of examples. Here's one specific one. Remember that um, there was a collection uh, in church at Jerusalem and uh, Ananias and Sapphira, uh, they decided to sell a bit of property and they kept some back for themselves. Now, there's nothing wrong with keeping some back for themselves, I don't think. But what they said made the other Christians believe was that they had given everything. And uh, Peter um, said, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back some of the price of land? And he goes on to say, while it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? After that it was sold, was it not under your control? Why is it that you have conceived this deed in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. So we have them, <laughs> the equivalent there. They lie to the Holy Spirit, verse Three, they lie to God in verse uh, four. Uh, the, the, it talks about um, in Hebrews chapter nine, uh, how much more the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, cleanse you your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. So he's eternal spirit. He's uh, not an impersonal force. He is part of the Godhead. Where this talks about his omnipresence. Um, I think, uh, who was it was praying this morning? Lewis and uh, praying about, you know, mentioning in Psalm 139, where can I go from your spirit? I think it was actually Russell that was praying uh, at that particular point. Uh, Lewis was absolutely brilliant this morning, wasn't he, by the way? That was a great word, thanks. But uh, um, where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend into heaven, you are there. He's eternal. He's omnipresent. He's got all the characters of God. He's got wisdom. Who has led the spirit of the Lord? Who has taught him words of wisdom? Um, now, there's a number of times in the Old Testament it talks about, uh, it uses this phrase, and the spirit of God came upon him. And I believe in the Old Testament, and I'll try and illustrate this later, um, that, you know, the Holy Spirit came upon men and women to fulfill particular tasks. The, um, you know, the, the Holy Spirit um, indicated to Moses how the tabernacle should be built. The Holy Spirit is signifying this. Um, he talks about in Hebrews chapter 9, um, the Holy Spirit uh, uh, came upon Bezalel. They had to make different uh, pieces of furniture for the tabernacle, the uh, lampstand, the tables, and so on. And uh, God says in Exodus chapter 31, I have filled Bezalel, uh, the craftsman, with the Spirit of God, with wisdom and understanding and knowledge, with all kinds of skills to make artistic designs for work in gold, silver, and bronze. So God gave Bezalel these particular skills. Remember what Pharaoh said of Joseph? Um, he said, this, can we find a man like this who has in him the spirit of God? <clears throat> um, Joshua, um, all these great 
heroes of the Old Testament. Take Joshua, the son of man, of Nun rather, in whom is the spirit, and lay your hand on him. Caleb has a different spirit, one of the two good spies who went into the land of Canaan. Balaam, now here's a surprising one. Um, you wouldn't have expected this, because Balaam was not a good man. He wasn't a righteous man, but God um, sent his spirit upon him, not uh, in order to, to bless him, but to use Balaam for a particular purpose. And uh, we'll get, fortunately, I don't have time to get into all that today. <laughs> so uh, Samson uh, talks time and time again, verse 6 of Judges 14, the, the spirit of the Lord came upon Samson with power and he tore the young lion apart. Verse 19, the spirit of the Lord came upon him with power. Verse uh, uh, 14 of the next chapter, the spirit of the Lord came upon Samson with power. But you remember there was a time when the spirit left Samson, when he agreed to get his hair cut by Delilah, and he thought, I'll just stir myself up like other times, but he did not know that the Lord had left him. So um, in the Old Testament, uh, you know, the Spirit of God comes upon people and leaves them. Uh, he equips them for various tasks. Um, Spirit of God came upon David. Uh, Spirit of the Lord came, uh, left Saul. Um, Psalm 51 uh, David's prayer of repentance uh, in terms of Bathsheba. Uh, make a clean heart in me, O God. Give me a new spirit that will not be moved. Do not throw me away from you where you are and do not take the Holy Spirit from me. Let the joy of your saving power return to me and give me a willing spirit to obey you. Uh, I'm, since we're going to run out of time here, I'll just skip over this one about Moses and uh, the influence in 70 men, etc., but um, just to give a, a sort of local illustration, um, you're all familiar with this man, Henry Bell. I recommend, by the way, that you go and see his grave within the next two or three days uh, at Rue Churchyard uh, because it's absolutely a carpet of crocuses. If you want a really nice scene, then go, go there. But uh, Henry Bell sits there looking at that all day and uh, we have the Henry Bell monument down the front but uh, Henry Bell was the first to put uh, a steam engine into a boat called the Comet uh, up until that time and for centuries you know sailors had always been uh, relying on an external force the wind and if it was a poor wind, they couldn't sail very far, but it was external. But, you know, when Henry Bell, a good Helensborough man, you know, put a, an engine into the Comet, it completely revolutionized shipping because there was a power within. And I think that's, we can look at this in a future study, but I think that's an illustration of you know, the Old Testament, you know, the Holy Spirit came and he left people. He fitted them for various purposes, etc. But in the New Testament, the Holy Spirit comes not as an external uh, person to us, but he comes to live within us by his power. He resides in every believer. We, our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. I'll click it in. Uh, the Holy Spirit is active in terms of uh, church work. Uh, the Holy Spirit said in Acts chapter 13, set apart Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. The Holy Spirit makes people elders. Uh, keep watch over yourselves and all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Uh, this is not, uh, you know, the, the, the work of an elder is not like applying for a job. You think, you know, I would like to be a bank manager or I'd like to be a, an engineer. I'll apply for the job. It's, uh, it's the Holy Spirit who makes people elders. Uh, 
an old guy used to say, there are two types of people. There's the appointed and the disappointed. And, you know, it's the Holy Spirit who makes people elders, be shepherds of the church of God. Uh, he bought with his own blood. And this is just two or three more slides to go. But this is very important. He is the Holy Spirit. I'll let you just let that sink in. <laughs> he is the Holy Spirit. And holiness is the most important aspect. Uh, you know, when we go through there, uh, you want a clean cup, won't you? <laughs> because if it's dirty, regardless of what you put into the cup, you, you'll probably reject it, won't you? It's the most important that we are clean vessels. Ezekiel uh, chapter 8, the Spirit said to me, Son of man, do you see what the people of Israel are doing? Do you see the hated sins that they are doing here to drive me far from my holy place? But you will see even worse sins. Uh, Acts chapter 30, sorry, Isaiah chapter 30. It is bad for the children who will not obey, says the Lord. They act on a plan that is not mine and make an agreement that is not of my spirit and so add sin to sin. That, uh, you know, we, we cannot just be careless uh, in terms of the work of the Holy Spirit. Sometimes people seem to see the Holy Spirit as a, a soft option, and but he's holy and he must be obeyed. Isaiah chapter 63, yet they, they grieved the Holy Spirit uh, they turned and um, became their enemy, and he himself fought against them. Then his people recalled the days of old, the days of Moses and of his people. Where is he who brought them through the sea and with the shepherd of his flock? Where is he who set his Holy Spirit among them? Zechariah chapter 7, they made their hearts like stones so that they could not hear the law and the words which the Lord of all had sent by his spirit through the men who had spoken for him in the past. So the Lord of all became very angry. I've got a responsibility as to what I say here in the platform. And I feel, you know, I'm answerable to God and God alone. And, you know, equally, you as the audience tonight, I've got a responsibility. If you hear the word of God, we've all got to obey it. It's not you know, a case of us being above the scriptures and decide, I like this bit and I like that bit. But if it's the Holy Spirit who sent us his word, then we should obey. I think we'll finish at that. I was going to go on to talk about the Holy Spirit and Jesus, but the pizzas have arrived and uh, I'm tired listening to myself and I'm sure you must be too, but um, we'll just uh, pray. Our God and Father, we give thanks for the work of the Holy Spirit in terms of opening uh, the scriptures to us. And we pray that if anything has not been of him tonight, that it will be taken away and forgotten about. And we, we long to see the Holy Spirit do a mighty reviving work here in, here in Helensborough. Perhaps at times we see it like a valley of dry bones where people are hardened and careless with regard to the word of God, they have no time for you. They rule you out of their lives. And, you know, we sometimes wonder, as we wander about the streets, can these bones live? But we pray that by your word and by your spirit, we will know that power, not by our might, not by our strength, but by your spirit, says the Lord. And we pray that in these days, we will yet see revival. This would be our prayer that uh, many will come to you. We give thanks for uh, those who were at the service this morning who need to hear the message. Uh, some have heard the message for many years and uh, uh, it's not been for the lack of trying of, of men to persuade them uh, with regard to these things. But we pray that uh, once more the Spirit will strive with such individuals. And uh, some have heard it just recently for the uh, first or the second time. And we pray that 
again, the Holy Spirit will open their minds and hearts. And we pray that this will be more than an academic exercise, that you'll help us through the week to um, remember that holiness, to remember um, the uh, impact of your word and to show the fruit of it in our lives, in our homes and in our communities. We give thanks for this time of pizza and uh, pray a blessed fellowship. And uh, we give thanks in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen.